noises. All right. <laughs> With that introduction, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, we are in an extraordinary place called the Barge. Uh, it's next to a bunch of barges <laughs> here on these little canals here in England. And it's a fabulous setting, I have to say. Uh, right in the area of Salisbury Hill and uh, military bases and whatnot in Pewsbury and surrounding area. So, and we want to thank in advance Miles Johnson for arranging this and making it all possible and for also for his assistance with the various cameras and of course Neil Anthony Samford is on the other camera. So uh, I'm here with Duncan, the grid keeper and very interesting individual and so we're going to find out all about his experiences, how he got where he is today and being somewhat notorious and having a quite a substantial YouTube channel called the grid keeper, right? Yeah. And what I want to start out with is actually, seriously, um, how did you get here today? Because in your life, uh, you have had a lot of exposure to this sector that we, you know, UFOs, the secrets, uh, the hidden secret space program, and also with regard to what we know of as James Cos Casbolt, Michael Prince, super soldier, and so on. So you have had quite a long relationship with him. Mm -hmm. You also know John Leonard Walson. I do. Um, quite a, another interesting <laughs> filmmaker and notorious uh, specialist, really, in, in planets uh, off, off the grid, etc. information. So let's start out with uh, how you broke into this sector. What, what was your sort of inciting incident? My family. All right. When, when I mentioned about King Harold. Okay. So I used to live in a, a village called Bosom, had a music company. And there was a, an incident where a historian had taken to court the fact that he believed that King Harold was buried in this local church. And the church didn't really like anyone bringing this up. So... Um, it was on the news, and I thought, well, it's only down the road from me. I'll go down there. Now, at the time, I didn't know anything about my family. So I've gone up to the church door. The historians came out. They told me what it was about. And jokingly, I said, well, you should tell me because I'm a relation. I didn't actually know I was at the time until <laughs> I spoke to my mother in the evening, and she said, you should go and speak to your uncle. He's got all these old documents. And then I discovered that I'm a descendant of King Harold's older brother. And it opened up a whole world of secrecy for me and cover-ups and it was the drive of trying to find out what happened to my family and how far back it went further than that that kept me going and it opened up everything else it just came along with it really so, all right so king harold uh 1066 it, all right and, and what was he Burke. known for he was he reigned for nine months, and he did more for this country than any other living monarch has ever done. Probably put together. <laughs> I'm not going to say you're prejudiced, but go ahead and tell I me what, what exactly, <laughs> what exactly uh, did he do? He was, his father was, well, his father was best friends with Edward the Confessor and supported Edward. Edward was celibate and married to Harold's younger sister which is why King Harold was always promised to become king. So the story of William being promised to be king by Edward the Confessor is just totally nonsensical from my point of view. And you can research this on Wikipedia and the internet and family tree stuff, but you, you can find out that Nathaniel Rothschild is descended from William the Conqueror. So therefore, in my mind, William the Conqueror was a Rothschild. So the whole 1066 of invading England when um, the whole of the British Army was sent up north for the Battle of Stamford Bridge, which must have been arranged beforehand, because as soon as that battle started, word was sent that it was going on to William in France. He's then come over and invaded Hastings, and there's no army to stop him. 
They're, they've taken over Hastings. They're up on the hill in battle. The whole of the army had to march down from Stamford Bridge on foot and then fight this invader. It's no wonder they lost. Okay, but where is King and Harold at the time? King Harold, um, he wasn't in Hastings. <laughs> well, they all came back to, to meet in Hastings and they all got slaughtered. Um, the bodies of the children were brought back to Bosham and the mother said, you know, we need to bury them in the churchyard. There's no one on, of my family in Bosham churchyard because we found documents saying that William the Conqueror said if we bury King Harold here, it will become a shrine and it will undermine what I'm about to do. Um, and he became king and brought in the Doomsday Book. And I think that if we hadn't have had that 1066 Doomsday Book, England would, well, it wouldn't, it obviously it wouldn't be how it is today, but it wouldn't be, they wouldn't have this much control over us in a way and the rest of the world, if that makes any sense. So are you <laughs> saying William the Conqueror became king? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and who, what is an this invader. Doomsday Book? What is that? The Doomsday Book was where they went round um, and they made a book with every property business and who owned what piece of land in this country and then they decided what land they were going to take away from people and bring in the French and give them the land. Okay, and, and in this scenario, everywhere. you're saying your your King Harold was somewhere in the background. Where yeah. was he? I don't know where he was at the time. Oh, all right. I don't, I don't know that so much. So, I don't know. What is really. his lineage but going back to? What I mean is, is he Anglo-Saxon? Yes. Is he he's Anglo-Saxon. Saxon. And and William the Conqueror is what French and Roman. French, Norman, Norman. Yeah. Roman. So the. the how I found this out, my grandfather was the Lord Worshipful Master of the Royal Tunbridge Wells Masons. And so was my uncle. They were councillors. They were, they were very involved. And they put together this family tree. And they went all the way around England to every parish council, every church. And they got any information they could find out about my family and put it in these two giant books, which I've still got today. And it's, it's all typed up and you can go through everything and every person in there, it tells you what they did as a job and it goes back to 400 AD. And it okay. is an incredible document. And it, sure. and it shows where um, it's even got how Harold's older brother had a son called Hacken Swainson and that's the, they didn't kill him. So he survived and that, our line carried on. But if you go into Somerset House in London, there's a book in there which shows part of my family tree. And again, it was done by the Masons and it goes all the way back to the Temple of Karnak in Egypt, to Amun Ra. All so right. that's where we think we originate from. <laughs> and it would also explain why, um, when I, I told you earlier, when I use Tim's technology, especially with healing, it happens so fast. And Tim tells me it's because I've still got that so you I've think carried you've got that DNA. DNA. It's come out in um, me. Right. And so let me say way. here that yeah. I interviewed Tim Riffat, uh, mm. a magician, who yeah. is actually on the dark path, according to his own um, admission. However, it does appear he might have circled round to the light because he's doing things for humanity at this time, which is quite interesting. And you appear to have also be on the side of the light. Uh, and you yeah. have been a very good friend with Tim Riffat for many years, correct? Two, it's only two years. Two I only years. met Tim oh, two was, years okay, ago. Okay, but you talk about him as if you knew him before then. I feel so. like we've known each other forever. Because right. as the grid keeper, I worked, I was a light worker. I felt like I was a pioneering light worker at the time. I was in all the forums <laughs> 10 years ago. I was working with Mary Hardy in America, who built the replica of the Giza Pyramid mm -hmm. in her garden. And she came over and we made the film series called The Holy Grail Vortex. And she took all the information from the book she wrote in the 80s, came to see me, and we went round to Avebury, Silbury Hill, Merlin's Mound, and we, we joined it all up and explained to everyone how it was used scientifically to levitate stones to build stone circles. And while I was on this journey, I encountered the Elohim, um, and I started going to crop circles. A lot of things happened in crop circles. And as far as I was concerned, I was a light worker holding the torch for the Elohim. But I never understood the Elohim until I met Tim. Right. And um, I then found out I was just being used. 
right. like most other people. <laughs> and Tim showed me who the Elohim really are. Sure. Um, and when he spoke in your interview and he talked about the fifth dimensional beings, the Enochian angels, this, he didn't mention it, but this is the Elohim. And, okay, um, and they are, they are Anunnaki in essence. Sort of. <laughs> They're not here for our benefit. They're here for their benefit. Mm. Um, the wage slave system, now a lot of people will disagree with me about this, which is fine, but the wage slave system that we all invest into, the energy you put into working, the, uh, the energy that's bled off you ultimately goes to the Elohim. And they also um, run the Elohim Grail code of the ram's horn, which is the symbol for love. So you have two spirals coming down into a point. And because they use that as a machine code, in any love relationship on earth that's in turmoil or misery, the energy that you give off from that, again, goes to the Elohim. And Tim showed me a lot of this, and it started to change the way I saw myself as a light worker. What am I really, who am I really working for? I want to save the world and be the good guy, but am I actually making it worse? And then I spent a lot of time with Tim, so did Annie, and he showed us things that just changed, just turned everything around opposite. And it was hard to get your head around because you're not, it doesn't make sense to start off with, but when you start using Tim's products and, and doing what he says, your life changes for the better. Mm -hmm. And incredible things start to happen. So, okay. Now, yeah, what I want to do is... If I explain that right, I don't know. Not, no, that's, I, I mean, that's all... But the Elohim, it's a funny thing for me. I love-hate relationship with the Elohim. But they, um, they used to feed... Yeah, they fed off a certain type of energy from my body, which was... Tim told me it was my brain power with Miles. Miles told me they feed off your legs. Why, I'm not really sure. Well, I, I'm, what they feed off is, the, is you know, what I would call kundalini energy yeah. and, and others would called plasma or orgone, yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, it's all good. Um, now, actually, but why we're here is to talk about sort of how you got into a relationship with James Casbolt, uh, aka okay. Michael Prince. Yeah, yeah. And so let's kind of go there. We, we circled back to all of this, yes, but let's I'm go in that direction. It all now. So in, when was it? 2006, I was looking at mortgage fraud on the internet and it led me to someone who was linked to the probe conference and they were doing something to do with mortgages and I rang them up and he said, would you like to come and stay for the weekend in Blackpool? I'll take you to this conference. And that's when I met Dave Miles. Dave? Dave Miles? No, older guy. Dave Starbuck. Dave Starbuck. Yeah, I stayed in a house with Dave Starbuck and a couple of friends and we went to the probe conference and, was, and James was there. And everyone kept saying to me, oh, you've got to go and talk to this guy. And we had a chat. I didn't know what he was talking about. And he gave me his CD about the Windsors and Satanism. And me and my friend Sahel, we listened to it in the car on the way home, just looking at each other, screaming every now and again, going, what, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was my introduction to James. But it was also the same time there was someone there doing a presentation on orbs. And I was absolutely fascinated. Do you remember that woman? She was from Wales. She did a documentary of the BBC and all their cameras went down when they went to the ley lines. But anyway, my friend sitting next to me, very... Oh, sorry, and and sorry, you can actually pan to Miles. It's, it, you know, Miles, we can have you on camera. You're a, a known entity, so if, if, if he does ask him so, a question and Miles says I'm not sure if Miles was there at that one when I first met James. I might have met you the year after, yeah. I think. Yeah, so I was fascinated about these orbs. What are these orbs about? And... So I'll come back to James in a minute. But me and my friend, we went up to a place called Kingly Vale in Sussex, which is the European version of the Valley of the Kings. Every picture we took had hundreds of these orbs in it. We had, we had dogs looking at us, dead cats looking at us, rabbits, people, Egyptian faces, you name it, it was there and it blew our minds. We then contacted James Caspar because he'd given us his phone number and he said, come down. So three of us drove all the way down to Cornwall and we met James on the beach in St. Ives. And I'll never forget this because 
I've we've parked. It's like six in the morning or something, and not, maybe a bit later. I can't really remember. But I've I've walked out onto the sand, and I'm talking to James, and this big Sea King helicopter. This was my first experience with the helicopters. <laughs> Came around the cliffs, over the sand, hovered next to us, and by now it was you know it was, there was people about. Um, they didn't seem to care who was watching, and the side door opened, and there was a bloke standing there with all the gear on, holding something. <laughs> James grabbed me and he went blue beam and threw me on the floor. And this blue beam, this blue light just flashed and it hit the crowd behind. There was some people walking along by the shops and it hit this chap and there was a car trying to get through the crowd and they all started fighting. They were trying to drag this chap out of the car and it was, yeah, it was quite chaotic. And then the helicopter just flew off and we were like, oh, okay, what was that about? So we got to know James over the weekend and we, everywhere we took a picture, we'd have pictures of orbs. Um, and then it was like, well, come and stay with us. So James came to stay in Chichester. We went up Kingley Vale, more orbs. We went to Goodwood. James started seeing the orbs. And James would point and go, there's an orb floating there. I'd take a picture and it would be there. And that happened a lot. And it's funny because I was looking back on... Um, some of our older pictures the other day, and it reminds me of something that Tim says about the, the parasites that latch onto people. You can see them in the pictures on the backs of our heads. You can see their faces looking back. Mm. And it wasn't until now I'd really looked back and, and noticed that. So yeah, I started spending a lot of time with James, and then someone got in touch with me who was JFK's personal advisor back in the days, uh, Michael. And he said, I need to go to Barrowmore Castle and stop a satanic ritual. Will you come with me? <laughs> I'm like, OK. So he's come over and he said, bring James with you. So we've all gone up to Barrowmore Castle on this great adventure. And we did. We went into the castle. We went round the back. Michael had rope with him. He was going to climb the Queen's Obelisk. I'm walking along like this going, we're going to get caught. We're going to get caught. And we did. <laughs> we got caught. But nothing happened. We were just told, and it was the same words. When you know, I said I went up to that UFO crash or the yeah. plane crash, okay. and the policeman said a certain thing. It was exactly the same words. I can't remember it exactly now, but I know it was the same. Okay. And we turned around and went away, and we went to the church, Barrowmore Church. And I remember standing there with James, and I said, "Let's change the vortex." And we couldn't do it. There was just this darkness creeping in over us. And we tried to change the vortex for 20 minutes. And our minds kept going blank. Um, next thing you know, a big Range Rover comes skidding into the car park. James just screams MI6. <laughs> and we're like, oh, no, what do we do? So we've jumped in the 4x4 four four and we've gone off up the road. And they're chasing us. And they chased us for 10 miles. We found a hotel, ran into the hotel looked out of the room and it had been changed now of a police car. There was a police car parked in the car park. And um, anyway, long, long story short, we went off to a stone circle and we did lots of other stuff and uh, lots of other <laughs> mad things happened. But that was, we just, we were into the same things. We became really good friends. And okay, that's what we'd do. We'd go off and have these adventures together. And we ended right. up at Peasemore. Yeah. Of all places. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so tell me, though, did he reveal at the time that he was, uh, you know, a super soldier? I don't know. Maybe the lingo wasn't used at the time. Uh, did he talk about his uh, altars or any of that stuff? I, not much. No, I never really asked him that much about all this funny stuff. And because I never knew whether to believe it all at, at the time or what... I never knew whether what he believed was real or sure. not real. And I'm not but sure whether sometimes he did. According to him, what even now you, yeah. you would probably say the same thing. Yeah, you I would. don't know what he yeah. believes yeah. is true. But I know James, I used to go to a church and say, right, the vortex is moving up or down. I'm going to change it for this reason. James would see, he, before I even did anything, I'd say, James, which way is the energy going? He'd look at the church town and go, it's going up. And I would confirm, and he was right every single time. Mm -hmm. So I know he, he started to see ley lines and the orbs and things like that. And as for being a super soldier and having a, an invincible skeleton, I'm not sure how much of that I believe is true. I believe James believes a lot of it's true. I know James can fight. I've sparred with him. I've seen him shadow fight. He's very fast. <laughs> 
You know, okay, he does well, have abilities and skills, but he, how far just, that goes, I don't know. So we're going to, you know, I'm going to have to fire some questions yeah, at you yeah, quite, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, so that we can yeah, get this yeah. kind of condensed. Yeah. Um, so at a certain point, I was in touch with James Caspel over the internet um, in, I don't even know if, it, I guess it was emails, I don't know, but mm -hmm. it was a, quite a while ago, right? Mm -hmm. In the early yeah. days of Camelot. Yeah, yeah. And he was sending us information. Yeah. Quite good information, yeah. actually, and it's still on Camelot for those that are interested. Yeah. Um, some quite, you know, accurate, very astonishing, quite, you know, specific, not yeah. general, yeah. you know, yeah. nonsense. And um, then at a certain point, he changed uh, his altar into Ma Michael Prince. Yeah. yeah. And there was a real substantial change. Yeah. Now, prior to that, I was supposed to interview him. He's supposed to show up for an interview, and he never did. Wow. Here in Didn't England. Okay. With James Casbolt, yeah. not with the Michael Prince. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you are you aware of when the changeover went to Michael Prince? God, I'm trying to remember. Whether it was before or after he went to the NSA. Well, okay, when you say he went to the before. NSA, where did he go? To the United States? Is that yeah, what you're trying I think to it say? Was, I think from memory it was Fort Lauderdale. And no one believed him, but I, he showed me the evidence. I, he, James was definitely in the American army. I've seen his yearbook with okay. the colour photos in of James with all these other army people, and it's a full on glossy book. No, I don't think, I don't see the point I've of seen someone. I've some of that as yeah, well. Yeah, I've held it, I've read it. Okay. And I've also I've held his son's birth certificate that said he was born in a military hospital. And when James, when Haley had the baby, they wanted it to be happen at home in their flat. James swears to me the baby was born in the flat, but we now think that they recreated his flat in an underground base and put them all in it. Oh. <laughs> the birth certificate says I can't. Oh, I should know. I can't remember. It was underneath. I don't think it was Denver Airport. It might have been Colorado. Something. It was underneath some airport. This military thing. It was written on this birth certificate, and he showed it to me. You know? Actually, I think it was in the southern United States, over towards the east, not the west. Was it? But I, I don't know yeah, why I, I don't, think that. I can't um, remember. Okay, so yeah. yeah, don't quote me on any of that. No, the, it, the, it doesn't. The you know, it's I'm not, not sure. like that crucial. Yeah. So yeah. at a certain point, he became Michael Prince. Yeah. At a certain point, I interviewed him at a UFO conference that happened in um, wasn't Laughlin, but it was kind of outside the outskirts of it. Was a strange place that time uh, that Laurie and Fenton set up Henderson. for super soldiers. Yeah. Was super that soldiers. yes, yes. Oh, you were there. That's right. We had that whole. We you there. had that. Strange oh, I wish I was there. <laughs> experience. You didn't go. I'd love to have been All at right. that if that happened. But at yeah. that point, he was yeah. definitely on the Michael Prince side side of things. This might have happened before then, because he thought he was the reincarnation or, of um, Prince Michael. Archangel Michael. Oh, okay, that's pretty general. Michael Prince, yeah, that's, yeah, right. that's what he used I mean, to say. Okay, and, fair enough. And I have problems with that. <laughs> okay, well, for I other would, reasons. I would too, for a number of other reasons. I'm not saying it's well. not true, but I have problems with certain entities that um, have done certain yeah, things. Yeah, and, and that these so called with. angels are not really angelic in the sense we think about them. No, well, I just, I just, just want to say it. So, yeah, so, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael are the Abraham ritual, which made the Goyim, and we're all Goyim, so I don't approve. <laughs> you know, I really don't. Well, it's okay. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. so okay, but you knew both individuals, right? Yeah. The, the same person, but in different yeah. altars. Yeah. And when you related to Michael Prince, were you relating to him the way you were relating to James yes. Caswell? Yes. Yes. I didn't. I didn't Did like all that a, stuff. But I didn't. You notice a personality change? Because I did. Yeah, bits and bobs, but I didn't know it was down to his experiences or what he'd gone through and that was changing him or whether it was all uh, to his mind control. I, see. I was never quite sure about All that, right, what about the idea know? that he, that his father was, I don't know, some kind of petty thief or something no, and his, I'll tell they you were exactly both thrown what into jail? Did. Do you think yeah, that was true? Yeah, I do. His, his, okay. his father was a drug smuggler right. for MI6, yeah. cocaine. Oh, okay. okay. So he had a fruit and veg company which was linked to Spain. Uh. Um, so they'd pack up all the fruit and veg, put a few kilos of coke in it. That would come into the beach in St. Ives and there'd be the mini black helicopters and everything. But his father was told, you know, this is black ops. If you get caught, we'll all disappear. 
I can't remember if he got caught or grassed up, but something went wrong and he ended up in prison. And because of what he knew, they killed him. That was James's motivation for everything. Everything you've ever heard from James, he was motivated by his father's death in prison because he was killed for the wrong reasons. Okay. For working for the wrong people. Right. And I believe that's true. I've always felt it's right and it's always made sense to me. All right. You know, really but do. in a certain sense, somehow that ended up, I think James went to prison as, t as well uh, around that time when, he, when his father went into prison. Uh, subsequently, James was in Did prison he? for a period of time. I didn't know that. Uh, I, this is just my memory. Yeah, yeah. Um, it it might have been part yeah. of the James Caswell story, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it could have been. He was, he was addicted to heroin at one point, wasn't he? Was he? So why did he go to prison? Was it, was it drug related? It or? was drug, rela drug related to what his father's business was. That ah, was my understanding. Okay. You know, related I might somehow. know, I just can't remember. Okay, he it doesn't matter. probably did tell me this. Um, so what was interesting is that Casbolt was quite a, an intellectual. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Whereas J uh, uh, Michael Prince is much more, for lack of a better word, man of action. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, when I interviewed him at that conference, um, he was with Max Spears. Yeah. And he was also indicating to, uh, to me, and I think probably everyone else, and I don't, Miles can substantiate that, this if he likes, uh, was that he was running, as he called it, all the other super soldiers. Like in some managerial capacity yeah. or supervisory, he was in charge. And there is no doubt that, that yeah. Max Spears was looking to Michael at that time as sort of taking his direction from yeah. him, what he could say, what he couldn't say. Yeah. On camera, well, he basically says... Stop. This is stop. Okay, we're still running, uh, though. No, but we're not recording your mics. Okay. Uh, let's shut that one. What's that? Okay, that doesn't matter. Okay, continue, sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, the mic's no longer working? No, uh, that backup mic, those mics are going to Okay, that's all, right. All right. that's, okay. all right. that's all so, right. Yeah. So he said on camera that um, he, he was a, a Nazi and proud of it. Okay. And, uh, and I think they both ag acknowledged at that point. Um, then there was a, a happening at that conference in which Miles and yeah. a bunch of people yeah. that night yeah. Uh, yeah. believed oh, they were taken off. Taken away. All, all of us. Right. Yeah. But I was not. I was in the hotel, okay. but yeah. I was with, yeah. I think I was with uh, someone. I can't remember who I was with there, actually. Uh, well, for the record, you interviewed Belinda Leslie. You explained the whole thing? Oh, no, not really. No? No. Everybody was taken. Yeah. And you were part of it, and everybody was told to be compliant. I was taken the second. I was not, though. Um, but Melinda's memory will also be altered, you know. Everyone has their own approach. There were, so, it was an interesting evening, but that's what you came up with in the morning, right? Yeah. And a lot of people substantiated what you had to say. Um, but there was a happening that night, yeah. for sure. Um, I, it's just my intuition that I was left out of that group yeah. for some yeah. reason, yeah. whatever that was. Uh, <laughs> I did an interesting thing that morning. I was part of a UFO sort of experiencer group, and I started going around the circle and, and reading everybody. Right. Um, not something I ever do. Yeah, yeah. So that was quite, a, quite unusual. Um, so that was an unusual conference, okay? Yeah, so I wish I was um, there. But... Interesting people were there. Because uh, I see that Super Soldier program as a failed program. I don't oh. see how it can work. Oh, I do. But, you yeah. know, that's a whole, yeah. but that goes yeah. back to, you yeah. know, our, our interview with Duncan O'Finian yeah. and the whole yeah. lead up and even Pete Peterson acknowledged that. Yeah. But this has to do with mind control, yeah. you know, and, yeah. um, and augment, augmentation yeah, of the they physical were used, body. Because it all started with the Star Wars films. Well, I don't know if with, it started with them. Well, but the they, main, he, yeah. The George big... Lucas tapped into that. Because... So, can I talk about? Yeah. yeah. We know the producer of Star Wars very well. Okay, so and not George Lucas, then who? No, Robert Watts. All right. Produced um, Papillon. Um, what else did he work on? Space Odyssey 2001. 
produced all the Indiana Jones films. Okay, and what's his take? <sighs> <laughs> I've sat with him for hours, and he's told me the most amazing stories about how they first got to make Star Wars. And I'm sitting there nearly crying my eyes, like, I can't believe he's telling me all this. And I had a wonderful relationship with Robert, and we were going to make films together about crop circles and all this. And then go back to Tim. Tim teaches me all about the Jedi program. And he said what they did, they were used bleeding the force off everyone through the cinema screens, channeling it through the ley lines into the Pentagon, and that would fuel, that would where the power would be, come from to, f to make the super soldiers for the Jedi program. Yeah. Um, um, this what, energy yeah. um, can, of, off humans can mm -hmm. be used for many purposes. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually links up to what's called the Vril. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, okay. Go. So, but let's yeah. talk about what this guy thought. So I tried talking about some of this stuff before. Never really wanted to talk about it. And we know, like, Annie used to date his brother, so they know she knows him um, ever so well, ever right. so well. Sure. Was it last year before last? Yeah. There was a conference in Worthing, and we haven't seen him for a few years. And big Star Wars conference in Worthing. Robert's up on the stage. Boba Fett, his, bro his other brother's there, and a few other people, Jeremy Bullock. And we were like, yeah. So he's always, whenever he sees Annie, he's like, Annie, yay, and all this. So we've gone into this room afterwards to talk to him, you know, but now we've, we've met Tim. We've known Tim for a few months now. He didn't want to talk to us. He didn't want to look at us. He didn't oh, want to, and it was really? sad. I felt really sad, oh. even today I do. Didn't want to say that there's no conversation. Okay, but what what he is looked, his contribution? He looked quite afraid. Okay, but what is what is I got that. But what yeah. is his contribution, or in your mind, yeah. to uh, to what you think is is the Star Wars sort of he made being the, he a bought, place of gener uh, where the he, germination of the idea of a super soldier came from? Is he this brought what the whole thing to say? together, it and I think him, yeah. So Robert put it all together. why. Because that's just what he does, but we don't. Because we can. Well, okay, we, we never credit, found this out. <laughs> okay, is he taking credit for, you know? for George Lucas's? Uh, no, that's what people no. in the industry have said. No, just producing it. About. No, he didn't write it or direct it well, or anything like asking. that. Yeah. He just produced it. He just put the whole thing together for them with he was them. Like yeah. Manager, yeah. The whole thing. He was executive producer. He made it happen. He's the make it happen man. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, what he I've does. worked yeah. in Hollywood for twenty years. I'm very familiar with the process. But. You yeah. know, what yeah. I'm interested in, I mean, would he do it in an interview, this individual? No. No? no well, you said he was on stage. He's he wouldn't even, speaking yeah, talking publicly. about normal Star Wars. Uh, in front normal of, stuff. No, in, in front of pe people dressed up in Jedi stuff and Whatever. Luke Skywalker. Fair and enough. It was that type of conference. There was a lot of truth in, in yeah. you know, metaphor and But the all fact that. that he wouldn't even, you know, he said, hello, I got him to sign some more of his pictures for Did you, me. You never asked him about it, though. You never found out. I couldn't. Is he afraid of, of Tim because he's gone against the No, I don't the think he's, I don't think it's it's the fact that it's Tim. I think someone has told him that we know we we okay. we know what the Jedi program was really about. Okay, what do you think it was really you know, about? It was about taking the energy off the public to make super soldiers. Right, so what is Pentagon. that's still a super soldier you program. Know? It doesn't matter yeah. where they get the energy. Yeah. Right. But he won't you know, like I said, he wouldn't talk to us. And I'm quite, I don't think I'll ever speak to him again. I, really, I don't know how that would happen. It's a shame, really. I really like him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I respect what he's done, no All matter right. what that was about. This I respect actually sounds shades of Stanley Kubrick. Do, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and, uh, did he, he, also did made, he must right. have known, he's English, he I'll must have known Stanley Robert. Kubrick. Yeah, 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 oh, he did, yeah. yeah. And he made, do, do you know Secret of the Sphinx with Charlton Heston? He made that. He made that. Yeah, Secrets Under the Sphinx. You can find it on the internet. It's really old from the Is 80s. Is this a documentary? Yeah. I see. And they were talking about all this weirdy yeah. stuff and a UFO being in the ground under it right. and all these other things. All right. So I know he was out there. And Robert was given, he told me, he was given a tape, a cassette tape for meditation. And his friend said to him, it was, it was someone famous gave it to him and said, when you're relaxed, play this tape. Da, da, da. Anyway, so he's gone to... Egypt with Charlton Heston to make this documentary. Back then, you could get inside the pyramid. He's in the king's chamber. Sure. He's, like, he's on his own. He's got his walkman. Yeah. And he's sat there 
He's not listened to any of it yet. He's pushed play and the voice came on and it said, breathe in deeply. Now imagine yourself sitting in the king's <laughs> chamber of the Giza pyramid. <laughs> right. I thought, what a wonderful thing. Yeah. So he's, he's had people come to him. He's been involved in the real crystal skull. I've which is what Steven Spielberg them. then went on to make the film about it. So, right. yeah, this, this man's got a lot to tell the world, a lot to offer, but whether we'll ever get that chance okay, to hear from him, I don't know. Okay, and his name is Robert... Robert Watts. Watts. Yeah, you can, anyone can look him. him up. Wikipedia, yeah. IMDb, whatever. No, yeah. Love him to bits. I love him to bits. Okay, yeah. then, yeah. If you think he knew uh, Kubrick? Yeah, back yeah. in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was product location manager for 2001, I think, wasn't he? I don't think he was producer, so he would have known So him, he yeah. would be maybe a bit younger than Kubrick yeah, at the time. Yeah, and so you remember the, the monolith sure. in, on the moon? Yeah. Do you remember Wilson's monolith? I in don't... one of his films, he found this tower on the moon like that with a bridge coming off it. Sure. We even went to show it to Patrick Moore. And when we, we sat there and showed this to Robert, we watched all Walson's films with us. And he went, I knew there was one there. <laughs> That's all I've ever got out of him, really. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fair so enough. So if you ever get the chance to speak to him, do it. But I, yeah, sounds fun. You know? uh, sounds like a fascinating guy. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the whole Kubrick mystery, what he traded mm. off in order to do what he did. Yeah. Um, what kind of deal was made and, and the, you know, the fact that, you know, they just had an exhibit at the museum here in, in London, yeah. like six months ago, of all of Kubrick's really? stuff. Really? Yeah, oh, it was wow, fabulous. But nice they don't breathe to. a word about what he was really talking about no. in his films. And the thing is, it's like Robert, he's very old now, and it's going to get to the point where none of these people will be where left to tell remembers. us anything. Yeah. You know, it'll be gone. That's I think true. that's such a shame, that's really. True. You okay, know, now really tell do. me, okay, so you have had a lot of dealings with John Walson. And I know I, him better than anyone. <laughs> all right. I really I'll, do. I'll take yeah. your word for it. Yeah, and, we and spent a lot of time together over the years, a lot, yeah. Now, are you able to tell the crashed UFO story that you told me earlier off camera yeah. on this? Yeah. Because I think it's quite fascinating, yeah. and especially the very tall alien, that's quite yeah. cool. I mean, the, and John actually filmed the thing, and then you've got it on the internet, but people yeah. don't real, really realize, right? No one believes it's real, so yeah. <laughs> what can you do? And then I showed you the other film, yes, where there's two aliens either inside a spaceship or inside an underground base. You know, the person holding the camera is very scared. You can hear it in their voice. You can just about make out the table and a blanket over someone, and, and the alien standing there with his hand on the leg, and the camera's looking down from the top and the alien looks, looks up. up yeah it's and quite i told you earlier when 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 he gave me that he, he was very upset about it and and didn't say i couldn't talk about it just said never ask him about it and for me it's the most mind-blowing thing i've ever seen and I, I, I mentioned earlier when we were at probe i had a, a, a photo of this alien looking straight into the camera and i gave it to the one of the remote viewers and if you're watching this, I'm sorry I did that to you. At the, at the back of the room, and he put his hand on it and just went, ah, don't do that to me, and grabbed his head. And I went, oh, this is real. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, people don't believe it. And people have said, oh, you took that off a movie. Uh, and I'm like, well, can someone just tell me where I took this from? <laughs> because Wilson gave it to me on a raw tape from a video camera, and I just looped it up because it was only three seconds long, put it on YouTube, that's it. Okay, so let's so, talk about the, the, there was what, what you guys thought was a crashed UFO, right? Yeah, you so it was a crash right, UFO. I'll keep this one short because I could talk for hours about this. That would be this. good. Um, and then it, it, it wasn't a crashed UFO, but... It was an aeroplane. Describe yeah. this, this setting and everything so, that happened. So a friend rang me up, something's fallen out of the sky. We've driven up to the top of Goodwood, round the back. There's a um, policeman there a fire engine, lots of blue lights. That's all we saw at that time. And the policeman said the same thing that was told to me at Balmora Castle. We've then gone up to the hill, looked down at the lights, couldn't work out what was going on. There was a military fire engine there as well. Where did that come from? Um, and then the silver light came down from space, two miles over Chichester, had a bit of a rainbow colored trail behind it. And a green light came out the front, flew around the South Downs and came past us. Still to this day, the most weirdest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, and I've seen weird. And you had a camera on you. <laughs> had a camera on me. I couldn't move. I didn't know what to do because 
oh, I must be in dream time. This isn't real. This, is, this doesn't happen. It's not making a noise. It's off the ground. It's a light. What? It's quite big. The size of this room, like this room. Not as high, but yeah, about this. And it went up the hill to the crash site. We've run back up there, looked down. It all looked the same. So we've gone away. It wasn't until a year later that I mentioned it to John Leonard Wilson. And we, we said the days and he said, oh, I've got something for you. And he gave me this tape. <laughs> and I watched it back and he'd filmed it from the opposite end <laughs> through his telescope. So he was on the site because he doesn't live far away from doesn't where doesn't live happened. far away and he saw the blue lights and just zoomed into the blue lights of his telescope and there's all this weird stuff happening. It was when he watched the film back and he went, oh, what's that? Now, when you watch the film back, the green light that flew past me, you see, see, because that's only still pictures at the beginning, isn't it? Which tells us he's got that on film because he's sure. taken that still. Yeah, because So where's the film of the green light that he's not the John given John Wilson, <laughs> we know, is yeah. always very careful if not to overstep. If 90% of it you haven't seen. Right. Which is just mind-blowing because what that, you're looking at is really good. So... In the video, you take a still, you see the green light that flew past me, you see that other light, which could have been from that green goddess fire engine, or it could have been another UFO. I really yeah, don't know. I, I don't I know. Hear you. And then you see the intradimensional etheric alien standing there about 30 foot tall with a ray gun in his hand, overlooking the whole situation. And you're going, what? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it's incredible. So... When you watch the film, you see in the background, there's a Cessna, two-seater plane on the ground. There's, now, there's three people standing by the plane. I haven't told you this bit yet. This is what James said to me. He said to me, All right. so the plane. So there's three uh, people standing around this plane. You can see them in my film. James said to me, that's you. And I'm going, what? What do you mean that's me? He said, you pulled the alien out of the plane. Now, it, it makes sense that there was three of us. The policeman said the same thing to me that was said at Balmore. So all I remember is, you can't be here, whatever, turn around and go. Had I gone in there and done something for them? I don't know. But the height of the people at the same height. Sahel was with me. So the tall one looks like me. The middle one looks like Sahara, and the short one looks like my friend Matt from Glastonbury. And I'm going, uh, but the, we, it was us three that were there. This is weird. So I don't know if I did pull the alien out. I've got no memory of it, but I do know that alien, I'm like walking poison to aliens, which is why I was thrown out of Peasemore. So that doesn't quite make sense, unless the only thing I'm not poisoned to is draconians. But then that was a grey, and I'm not too keen on greys. So. Well, greys work for dr draconians. Exactly. So there's so, something I've still got to find out there. But Okay, but, but I want you to tell about how the Cessna was flown. Yeah. So you? the Cessna was flown from Portsdown Hill, um, which is Portsmouth Navy Base. And the grey was put into the plane. A Navy Admiral flew the plane to Goodwood because there's an airfield there. And it was when it got just before the airport, it was shot out of the sky. It just so happened to land at the highest, one of the highest points around there. Um, when you look at the film, there's, the only thing pulled out is a grey alien. And okay, but was it... You know, was it, actually, was it actually shot out of the sky or was it actually... Gently I put think it down, would have been so gently it didn't, put down. Yeah, you know? it's not smashed in smithereens. No, my, it actually was made to land. My friend that land. witnessed it just saw a flash of light and then this light coming down. Now, it didn't right. go... It was like yeah, that. Yeah, and it's not demolished. So it the down. plane is still intact. Um, the only damage you can see on the plane is... Well, actually, the wheels... Yeah, Cessna, yeah. Well, whether it has wheels that come out or not, I don't know. But that plane is sitting flat on the ground. Right. So the wheels are either squashed or the wheels were never... Right. Or out. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I don't call that a plane crash. I call that something else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Fair Not enough. Not even a UFO crash, is it? It's, no. It's very it's interesting. It's just some sort All right, of incident. So you believe still... there was an alien delivered, a grey yeah, or whatever, yeah. and then go ahead. So in the film, this thing's pulled out, and then what you think is the firemen walk over to the plane, and as they put, go to touch this thing, the hands light up, 
and they bring it over to the left of the film where you see the big light with the funny beam, which could just be because of the camera. And then they're all standing there. And when you freeze frame it and take a still shot or look at it on a giant big 60 inch telly, you can see that these three tall things have got little horns on their heads, dark wings behind them, their knees are in a slightly different place and they sort of walk slightly funny. And their necks do look really long and their chins are a bit funny. But that's all you can sort of make out. But it's the tall one stands there and he puts his arm around the short, this short grey. Reminds me of a mini version of the Marshmallow Man. Or whatever it was there that was in the Ghostbusters film. That big giant thing, the white thing. But a mini version, that's what it looks like. And then it walks back to the light with this thing and then the, the camera sort of moves around and you see, you can see the fireman standing by the, by the fire engine, just watching and I'm going, oh. So that still picture, I printed it off. I put a, a copyright thing on it with, to do with the film, gave it to James. James goes to the NSA, <laughs> takes, got the picture in his pocket and he gives it to, who did you say it was? Carol Thatcher. Oh. Yeah. Head of MJ12, Head of MJ and the more you said that, time. that sounds really familiar, like I might have known that, I can't remember. Right. Given her the picture and she's looked at it, got a pen in her hand, put it in her mouth, snapped it, screwed her face up and said to James, where the fucking hell did you get this from? Oh, a grid keeper gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> she turned around and said, this, these are winged draconians, as talked about in the Old Testament, no one in the world is ever supposed to take a photo of them. Now, when James said to me, that's you in the picture, in the video, he remote viewed the whole thing. He spent a whole week concentrating on the film, looking at it and okay. everything. And he said, so he gave me that and he gave me one name. He said, I've got this name, but I don't recognise it and I know nothing about it. And he said, all I've got is Hatton, as in Hatton Gardens. So H-A-T-T-O-N. Now, I was obsessed with something called the Phoenix Journals many years ago, channeled in the 70s or 80s or early 90s, I can't really remember. Yes. Yeah. In Nevada to this woman and she put all this information down and it was all channeled from a draconian called Commander Hatton. I remember this actually, having yeah. come across that. And it blew my mind and I thought, winged draconians, he's a tall one. Hmm. I've always had a thing for this Hatton. Where, where is my connection? And James used to take the piss out of me. There's loads, he kn James knows loads about me that I don't know, mm. about my life, that I'll never know unless he tells me. And he used to make jokes about um, all that stuff. But anyway, that's, a, that's probably another story. I won't open that can <laughs> of worms. We'll do Venki and Enlil and all sorts of things. Oh, <laughs> all right. And Armin Ra and all that other stuff. Right. But, um, yeah, I've just lost so, my train of thought. But no, yeah, I mean, it was, okay, so, yeah, it was, so the, it was this just is basically though. what happened. Yeah, so yeah. the guy got delivered, then he got rescued, basically taken off by the draconians, yes. in theory. Yes. Um, and this whole incident all happened on this Goodwood, this this mountain, which Goodwood's actually, a special place. John Walson has done yeah. a lot of shooting yeah. from Goodwood, yeah. as I understand all of it. it. And, uh, it's all done from Goodwood, all of it. Yeah, okay, you know? all of it. <laughs> I didn't and know. then there's the time where... Um, he showed me the spaceships because he always used to say to me, come and have a look through the telescope. I'll show you it's real and all this. And, you know, I'm, I'm human. I've got that doubt. Well, what if it's not real? And I've gone this far of it. I don't, want, I don't want it to not be real. What if he's lied to me? Oh, my God, what am I going to do to him? Oh. <laughs> so we've gone on the, up the top of Goodwood and he's laid, I think I told you earlier, he's laid down on the ground and he's holding a telescope like this in his arms on the ground. And he's now following the moon and something else. And I'm going, how do you do that? I don't know if any of you have ever tried to hold a telescope and follow anything in space. It's fun. No one in the world's ever done it, apart okay, from this well, man. Okay, well, I can tell you a similar thing have you got with, someone with else John Walson oh, okay. in, in Malta. Yeah, yeah. He had his, a fairly big telescope that he actually shipped a, over there in a plane. That would have been the same one. And he, the, the and he plane brought one. it like the in, same a, one. in a doggy yeah. Yeah. Uh, carrier uh, or something. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that he pulled along with wheels. And he, we wanted to look at the UFOs because that night we went yeah. on top of a very high rise hotel. Yeah. Forget it, I think it was the Intercontinental, but I'm not, don't quote me on that. So yeah. we're up on top, very night, and it's kind of like hazy, and we wanted to see the UFOs. And then what he would do was he would actually know where to go and see. 
And so he'd aim the telescope. And see, that later I realized that that's not so easy to do, is no. to know where is the UFO yeah. going to be yeah. Yeah. so that you can track it, Yeah. right? Yeah. So he's very good at, at he has sort of a sixth sense, if yeah. you want to call it that. Yeah. Yeah. And he's actually said this before, where he knows where to focus the telescope. He gets a, yeah. sort of a message. And it's because he's so at one with his equipment, you know, one that it just becomes, yeah, <laughs> part of him. Yeah. And he gets the message and he just does whatever yeah. He's, yeah. he's getting the in, indicator to do. I, I don't think he would mind us saying this um, about no, him. No. But you know, when it's very that, interesting. That, that time when he was doing that. And right. He said to me, choose a star. I said, Sirius, point it as Sirius. And he zoomed in and you see this light and as he gets closer, the light starts to change. And all of a sudden there's just this spaceship. There's this square looking thing with a thing sticking out. Not the light you'd see of a star. And I just lost my shit and freaked out. I, I, I smoked about 20 fags, oh, yeah, half an hour. I was just going through them like this. I was pacing up and down. I was jumping around. I was banging <laughs> myself on the head. Why? because he had his video camera on the back of the telescope and there was no tape in it. Because I thought he was going to trick me by playing something uh -oh. and pretend he's looking at it, but it was, but it, it was real. But he it, wasn't recorded either. No, he couldn't record, there's saying... no tape in it. I, oh, I, I recorded it for oh, my video camera. Right. So I recorded him filming right. it and you can see the back of the camera and everything. Right. I've put that on YouTube. Of course, most people didn't believe it, but... Why would, why would we believe all this stuff? How conditioned we all are, you know? Spaceships, what are you talking about? You know, even now in 2019, it's still a bit out there. All right. But it isn't, is it? It's no. real. <laughs> no, it's very real. Oh yeah, and the other one kills you or something. I can't remember. That, but it reminds me of that, yeah. Yeah. Um. So mm. <laughs> now we're at this very interesting place. And Miles, you were talking about Silsbury Hill, right? Yeah. And this Silbury base, Hill. Silbury Hill. And at, yeah. there's a base in, what is it called? Yatesbury Field. Yatesbury. It's, it's, a former, it's a former airfield. Uh, well, it still is. If you come here to do crop circles and see them, you can take a little micro light from there. And, uh, a lot of horrible crop circles used to appear there, the small ones. The, yeah. mm, Dirty, horrible, ugh, once you walk in and go, oh, I'm walking straight out. <laughs> Used to appear at the end of Yates Field. Yeah. Yes, and that's the one that did... Do you remember when they did the Weetabix one? They did the Weetabix one just for a laugh or something to do with... And even then there was a small, horrible crop circle that was put near that. Okay, when you um, see the horrible, are these the ones built by the military? Why is it horrible? Why do you call it, it that? It felt horrible. Felt it felt bad energy. and heady. Oh, and right. Because I believe that crop circles are made by all sorts of things. Sure. And even that people are making crop circles, we shouldn't ignore them because what made them make the crop circles? <laughs> and, you know, if, you've, if you're pro I look at crop circles like wave signatures, like a homeopathic remedy. Not mm. that they're all made, most of them are remedies. They're not, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I used to wish they were. I wished to wish they were all good and everything sure. was good for us, but it's not at all. <laughs> it's not. Fair is enough. It? Yeah. So, okay, so now you know uh, Tim Rufat for a while now. It, two years. But, two years. But you've actually become the person that he trusts to have his videos, put his videos online. His trusted sidekick. <laughs> okay. So to say, yeah. When now, I is met, there anything when I you want to say about your relationship? Yeah, yeah. When I, met, I want to tell everyone how I met Tim, how we met Tim. I finally got to America to go and see Mary Hardy, and I went to the pyramid, and I learned how to open and close pyramids, all sorts of stuff. And they were part of a group that was stopping using vortex energy to stop the superstorm that hit Florida and everything. Was mm -hmm. it two or three years ago? Yes. So. We went to the fountain in Brighton, did our thing with our dousing and stuff. And as we walked away, I looked round and this guy with a shopping trolley, looked like an old tramp. Sorry, Tim, but that's how he looked. Walked up to the fountain and he's bent over, plugged the crystal into himself and he's drawing these squares and he looked like a complete nutter. But I thought, well, we must look like nutters to a lot of people. So I said, Annie, I'm gonna go and speak to him. So I went over and I said, excuse me, are you working with the ley lines? And he went, yes, I am. I went, oh, brilliant, we do that. Uh -huh. Thinking we know what we're doing. <laughs> and you meet Tim and it comes to ley lines, you realise you don't know anything. So, 
I said, oh, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm, you know, codes and all this. And I said, oh, I've just been to America, you know. Uh, Stop the big stupid storm. I said, we did it. it. What we did actually worked. He looked me in the eye and he went, well, I started it. Smiling. And he smiled. But we both smiled at each other. I didn't understand why he would say that to me. But something inside me told me that he was right. I don't know why I did it. It's incredible why he, did, why he does all that stuff. So um, he then said, um, here's my website. Have a look. Within five days, I've come back with a big board of money. Tim, I need these crystals. You're the one I've been waiting for. I knew you were coming. I just didn't know it was going to happen like this. I was told years ago, um, I've got an incredibly psychic, we've all got psychic friends, but this girl, she, she's the one that I rang when I was on top of the hill with the fire story I told oh, you. Right. Right. That's, yeah. that's her. Yeah. And she said to me, she was the one that told me about my true Armin Ra connection before I realised it was written down somewhere. She told me just by looking at my hands and touching my head. And she said to me, you can move mountains. I don't know, what does that mean? She said, no, you can do anything. You just don't know it yet. You don't know who you are. And when you find out, you will have celestial weapons. Mm. I only realized this a month ago. <laughs> celestial weapons that I now use, and they're all sitting in my bag here, are all from Tim. Okay. And I know, and to move a mountain, I'm not going to tell everyone how to do it, but it's easy. Using Tim's technology, it's easy to move a mountain. Basically, it's an earthquake. <laughs> All right. You know? Right. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, but yeah. Um, yeah, I know exactly how to do it. And uh, yeah, if I was always told, because of my bloodline, who I am and everything, I will meet someone and I will be given celestial weapons that will change the world. Not just weapons, tools. And I know I go on about Tim all the time, but I, I've seen a lot, I've done a lot. All I wanted was the best for humanity. I want to see humanity evolve. I don't care for aliens and anything else because they're not humanity. I want to see huma the core of humanity evolve. Mm. And um, as far as I can tell, Tim's the only one that's brought anything to the table that's working and changes things. And I've seen that for okay. myself. And, um, you know, my health is incredible. I've, I've had a smashed ankle my whole life. It's agony every winter. I can't walk properly. I bought um, health crystals from Tim. I feel like I'm 16 again. You know, my arthritis has gone away. Um, he's taught me how I can eat whatever I like and change the molecules in the food. And you taste and feel the difference. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using his anti-aging technology, which Annie's also using. Oh yeah, and we've been tested on a bioresonance machine that we've been on, tested on for years. Yeah. Um, after the UFO incident, I was tested on the bioresonance machine and the woman looked at me and she said, have you ever, ever come into contact with an alien artifact? I'm going, what are you asking me that for? She said, you've got more gamma radiation in you than I've ever seen in anyone in my entire life of doing this. I'm going, oh, well, I'm going to die or what? <laughs> but since I met Tim and he gave me my um, nuclear crystals, it's gone. Straight away, gone. So I started using Tim's anti-aging health technology. And he went to get tested on the bioresonance machine. And w what the machine does, they should have one of these in every hospital. I don't know why they don't. It tells you everything about your body. And it said... Blood age, so they can measure your blood cell to your year age. So if you drink and smoke, you're, and I, so I'm 45, my blood age might be 50 or 60. Uh, it doesn't go the other way. Biological, well, cellular, biological age. cellular age. So Annie's came back as a 10-year-old girl. And we're going, what, is the machine broken? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> and this woman, she does this all day long, every day with people. 20 years. So we've gone back together. Annie's gone in first. She came out, she said, I'm not allowed to tell you my results. So I've gone in, and the woman just looked at me, and she said, Look, your result is the same as Annie's. And I said, what is it? She said, you've got a biological blood age of zero. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? How? How? What, what does that mean? She said, well, as an adult, your blood cells regenerate roughly every seven years, mm -hmm. so we age. Mm -hmm. As a newborn baby, you're regenerating, I think it's every seven days. She said, you're regenerating every seven days. She said, you won't look any older than this. Right, so here I am on camera. If you're all still here in 30 years' time, 
and I look really old. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but here, I've actually got it in my bag. I carry it around with me. This is the company that tests, tests us, the National Natural Therapy Advice people. Um, and this tells you lots of things. It tells you about my... I smoke. Don't mind people knowing I smoke. I love smoking. I smoke good tobacco. I don't smoke crap tobacco. <laughs> Not really. See. All right, so you're <laughs> showing yeah, us There this. you go. Biological age is none. I know it's just a bit of paper and I could have made that up, but that came from a company. Okay. And to use some, some crystal products that aren't like any other crystals on the planet and then come back with that. And then We're actually now customers. Yeah, and they're some of our best customers well, now. That One of them's a brain surgeon, and they've bought health crystals for all their kids and everything from Tim. And they're loving it, and they're seeing results already. They've bought magic kits, and they're, yeah, they're going the full hog. And, and scientists yeah. as well. And they're scientists, and they, and they get it, and, and they're seeing it. And I think, wow, good for you. So it's, it's quite exciting. All and they've right. even developed Tim's anti-aging crystal by firing a laser through it creating a box so that they can have a room where people can come in and have therapy using one of Tim's crystals. And we rang him up and said, is this going to work? And he said, actually, he said, that will work. <laughs> so he's given them permission to do it. And I'm thinking, wow, this could, we need more people. You, there's, there's quite a few people with the anti-aging stuff. And I'm trying to get people to go and find these machines to go, get yourself tested, talk about it. Mm. You know, people need evidence, you know, no one knows who Tim is, he's just some random guy that's come out of nowhere claiming he's got all the answers. Well, where's the evidence? And Tim's the guy that goes, yeah, I've done all the study, I've done all the science, I've produced it, I've worked with the Russians, I've done this, it works. He'll just come along and go, it works. And you go, well, prove it to me. He goes, I don't care. You don't have to buy it off me. He doesn't care if anyone buys any of this off him or not, which is a, which is a weird one to get your head around. Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, and, and there's some of his stuff is really expensive. And people are like, he should be giving it all away for free. Now, if Tim helps, or I mentioned Goyim earlier. You can't just go and help a Goyim without being condemned by cosmic law because you're guilty of... Anyway, that's another story. So, what did you just say? Wait, well, what it, wait, wait, wait. That's it, the what chakra you, thing. What do you so, consider a goyim? What is that? Um, someone who takes all the shit from all the rich people. So, the, the elite families, the 13 families, are, des are descended from the 13 moneylenders that Jesus threw out of the temple. They were Sanhedrin Illuminati, founded by King Solomon, who did the Goetic Demons. So the 13 bloodline families that run today are all descended from them. So they had to perform, are we done? Huge occult rituals for, the future, for their future ancestors. The Abraham ritual with Michael, Gabriel and uh, Raphael allowed that bloodline to stay in power, live a long time, gain a lot of stuff. But the Jesus thing was to then put Jesus on a cross, which is a box. Con consciousness in a box. If you fold up a cross, you've got a, a box, which is the cube of Saturn. Mm -hmm. And that was nothing but a scapegoat ritual so that any of the descendants of the 13 bloodlines in the future can do whatever they want to the goyim, and the goyim still suffer, and they get all the karma from the elite for doing it. I've never agreed with that. And that's the core secret of the Illuminati, never been spoken about on camera by anyone in the world apart from now, Tim does a chakra removal service, and I think most people think it's a joke. Um, and he had a lot of issues with her chakras and well, her I've awareness. Done lots of them with and she's done Kundalini work, she's done all of that stuff. Reiki, yeah. And um, Tim said, Well, I can remove them all, pull out the Zion parasites. So the Zion parasite is installed into every human when they're born, it becomes your inner voice. Now, this is, a, this is another interview to, for me to explain all this properly or people will just argue with me and go, that's not yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, it, it, but it's because, okay. So, I mean, this is a, a launch pad. Yeah, so, so um, I said to Annie, yeah, we should get, it, get this chakra removal done. So it was expensive. It's not cheap. It's thousands. Now, why would Tim charge $10,000 to remove your chakras? Why can't he just do it for you? But the amount of energy he has to use to pull them out 
Okay, well, and he's not pull out, pulling out a chakra. He's so, pulling out, he might be pulling things no, out of it. No, he's destroying it, gone. She's right. got no yeah, chakras. I, I mean, yeah, that's your away. point of view. Yeah. But yeah. So, From my point of view, I knew what yeah. I felt before. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. And he, but it's not the same. He built here a breath. It's it's all lingo, you know. It's, no, it's, it's okay. It's, it's as I'm saying. It's no metaphor. It's what he. Did. I understand, yeah, yeah, but yeah. what I'm saying is whether yeah. you remove it, whether yeah. you take something out uh, of it, and it's it. cleared, yeah. Yeah. is another. Oh, it's, gone. It's Burn them away. Yeah. It's Burn them away. So he then um, built her a new awareness, brand new awareness, right in front of me. Okay. Yeah, proper fucked. And I'm standing there. It's on YouTube. People don't believe it. They think it's a joke, just so we can rinse them of money. But money is complex number energy. Complex number energy is used to build reality. So, yeah, we sell products. We put money in the bank. We don't touch the money because we use that to continue what we're doing. We use the energy from it. So that's why Tim charges for all the things he does, you know. And a thousand pound for a crystal that can let you live between 200 and four years old. People think it's a joke. Only two people have bought that one so far. It's only been out for a couple of weeks, but only two people have bought it. And I think life's cheap for people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? Okay. But, so, but anyway, we're, not, yeah, yeah, we're not doing yeah, that yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, so no, we're not yeah, yeah. promoting that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't mean to. You can cut that out. I didn't, I'm not trying to promote anything. That's okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I get where you're going. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So yeah. at this moment, what you were <coughs> actually talking about was that yeah. an Illuminati taking energy from people yep. and pulling it out of them and yeah. then basically using it yeah. to do magic. So the and that's a very common thing. Yeah. And that's actually known, yeah. very well known. And a lot of the energies are never talked about. And this is why I've, I've been put off by the Pleiadians and all that, giving humans information. Well, they haven't given, us, given them enough information. Because free will is an energy and it has a name and it's called hyperinfinity. Mm. I didn't know that till I met Tim and he showed me the science of it. And I'm going, why don't they talk about this stuff, you know? Why don't they say what's really going on? All these top secrets of the Illuminati. A being could have channeled that to someone. Why, did, why haven't they? Mm -hmm. you know? And I yes. used to collect channelings by the thousands. I had a room full of binders. Um, going back 10, 15 years, and I was obsessed with But a all lot of, of them. this channeling is churn. But I'm glad I it's did it. It's just a repetitive... Yeah, yeah. You know, a bunch of information that, and, as you say, yeah. it never actually goes up above a certain level. No, and it's been going on since the 60s. Right. And, and the, don't, oh, no, we're, we're going to be, we're going to ascend this year. We're going to ascend this year. Did you know that? <laughs> just like we were in the 60s, just like uh -huh. we were in, you'll all be dead. You know, it doesn't work. Right. People need to change. So I've put, I, from my point of view, I've now put all religion, all occultism, all light working. I've put everyone in the same boat. They're all doomed unless they wake up because they haven't woken up. But where's the information going to come from? Well, as far as I can see, Tim's the only one who's ever brought forward these core secrets because he worked for them. Mm. And, he, and they ended up in this fight. He ended up in this fight with the Rothschilds. It went public. Tim's like, well, I can say what I like now. So he's published all of it on his websites. <laughs> all these core secrets. And I, you know, even if people read... Ah, that's it, yeah. Nostradamus. I need to get permission to tell you how I know this. But it blew my mind the other week when I found out how this happened. But I believe that the last chapter that Nostradamus ever wrote in his book is about him. All right, well, this is going to sound a little, uh, <laughs> like idol worship here. You know? Yeah. No, go and read it. Just go and read the last chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Tim's total intent manifests. So Tim's cosmic law book in the earth. That's why he can do all this. He's the only one that can do all this. I don't agree. You know, I know, I know you don't. That's yeah. fine. I, knew that. I know that. Yeah. yeah. I know. That's um, fine. That's it's not one person. You know, every, like all of these powers we yeah. all have. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah, but not no one one's person. doing anything. Nothing. Well, actually, on the contrary, yeah. they are. Are they? Yeah, yeah, we are. Okay. There are many people. Yeah. He's not the only one. What, but what I do about, believe he's yeah, doing something. Who's doing anything about anti-aging and living? We all to, are. Absolutely. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot. So you can live to 200 then, doing what you're doing. Is that what you believe? It's, I think it's very possible. Okay. I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's kundalini activation. Okay. 
We've got a lot more to talk about. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. Oh, so, no, this is good. This is brilliant because we'll yeah, find a I common mean, no, ground. It's, I want to find, find a common ground with you on all this other stuff. Yeah, no, it's all right. In, I mean, because, you know, know you have to see what you come this. across. I've been studying, the, you know, all yeah, of this yeah, stuff for yeah, many, many years. Yeah. And I liked him, and yeah. I know he's doing some good stuff. Yeah. Um, not sure it's all good. Ah, the black magician, black magician, white magician. Because he's a black magician, everyone thinks he's out to get everyone. From what I've seen, black magicians can heal people so much quicker because they have direct access to hell space. And if you look on the Argan diagram of the circle, hell space is where you erase things from reality. So if you want to erase disease and you can get into hell space, you're going to do it very quickly. That's how he's taught me to do it. Anyway. All right. Well, so, that's, you know, it's a way of working. You know, yes, okay. Yeah. And, and there's lots of different ways. To there do is. It. Yeah, and yeah. right path, left path. Yeah, uh, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, you yeah. know. That's not the end of it, but I, I will say that in his case, yeah. um, see, well, we talked about this on my interview yeah. with him again. Yeah. Yeah. If you go far enough into self, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. doing things for yourself, you end up doing it for someone else yeah. because it, yeah. it, there's, it's not, it's, it's a three yeah. through line. Yeah. Okay. And ultimately the negative will join the positive. So, and it's all one, the snake will eat its tail. And thank you very much for listening. And yeah being here Brilliant. today thank you. and thank you thank very, you much, very much it's finally a pleasure to meet you after it's all these lovely. years yeah lovely <laughs> lovely to meet you as well you know? Brilliant. And thank you miles and thank you cut